Good morning, everyone. Technology is reshaping so many industries and changing the very way we live, but perhaps none more so than healthcare, um, whether it's robotics, surgery, perhaps even changing hospitals as we know them. Um, we have an incredible uh, cross-section of technology and the healthcare industry here today to discuss how this is going to happen. There's been a lot of talk here at Davos about AI and jobs. We're going to, of course, get to some of those questions today, but we're also going to talk about the possibilities that AI and the technology revolution is unleashing on healthcare. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, the first is Albert Borla, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Pfizer from the US. Satya Nadella, the Chief, Operating, Chief <coughs> Executive Officer of Microsoft, um, which plays a very interesting role in terms of working with partners across the technology and healthcare spectrum, especially with AI. Michael Niedorf, who is the CEO of Centene Corporation, um, one of the largest healthcare providers in the US and the world, um, and Rajiv Suri, who's the president and CEO of Nokia. Um, I'd love to get started. If you could, um, and Albert, uh, we, when we were talking backstage, you, you were mentioning how really we're kind of at a breakthrough in terms of life sciences and technology coming together in ways that we've never seen before. Yes, first of all, let me start by saying how honored I am to be part of uh, a panel with such uh, esteemed uh, uh, innovators here. And uh, I would like to say that um, the impact of technology on healthcare, it is a topic that I live in brief. I, I cannot say it is what keeps me up at night, but I can certainly <laughs> say that it is one of the things that uh, gets me out of bed in the morning because I'm very excited with the magnitude of the opportunity and uh, I can see the profound impact that technology can have on health and impact, uh, on health and wellness, which is of course the passion of my life. And coming back to what you just said, the pace of health innovation will accelerate and will accelerate exponentially. The past was defined by individual siloed progress within its scientific or technological field. Today, individual advances in life sciences or digital technology are colliding to create massive synergistic effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, the possibilities are enormous. And I'm not sure we understand right now the full extent of them. But I could certainly say that there are four themes that have clearly emerged in the healthcare sector. The first is that technology will help us bring more, better medicines to patients for, uh, and much faster. Artificial intelligence, uh, medical uh, devices, uh, biological sensors, digitization of healthcare records are all supercharging discovery capabilities right now. And we will be able to develop solutions for unmet medical needs that today are very difficult to crack. The second thing. Technology will improve physicians' ability to manage sickness. Armed with very powerful tools, they will be able to predict or diagnose diseases much earlier. They will be able to apply personalized treatments, mm -hmm. and they will be able to monitor real time the progress of their patients so they can intervene when necessary. The third is that uh, technology will empower patients to take an active role in managing their own health. We used to go to the doctor just waiting for instructions. <clears throat> Today, patients, more informed than ever, and armed with their own research and understanding, they expect to be part of the decision making when it comes to their medical options. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Technology could disrupt the relations of the healthcare system stakeholders. For the first time in decades, the business model that defines these relations, it is an, at an inflection point and enabled by technology is ripe for disruption. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, technology is touching every single aspect of the value chain of healthcare and can transform each one individually or the whole care system as a whole. And uh, this is why 
I think the impact could be so profound. Sacha, what are you seeing? You work with companies um, around the world. Um, AI is something that springs to mind immediately. Um, are we going to be seeing big changes with imaging and surgery, robotics? What are, what are yeah. some of the biggest uses that you're, that you're seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously sitting in uh, between two real experts in uh, what's mm -hmm. happening in healthcare. But one of the uh, great privileges I have um, as a technology provider and a platform provider, in particular around AI in today's age, uh, to see the advances uh, in uh, healthcare. I mean, you just take what's happening with AI and uh, people with different abilities being able to fully participate in our society. One of the most exciting things for me is to see advances in computer vision really being applied to help someone with visual impairment to be able to actually interpret the real world. So we have an app that's on, in an app store called Seeing AI, which completely changes uh, the ability for someone with visual impairment. Uh, similarly, take some, someone with dyslexia. Uh, their ability to read uh, has now been improved because of the advances in machine reading and comprehension. So in Word or in OneNote, uh, you can actually use these tools uh, if you have even uh, dyslexia and improve your reading. Uh, we put recently, in fact, inspired by uh, one of the uh, patients of ALS, uh, eye gaze technology into Windows. So that means just with your eyes, you can type. Um, and that just completely empowers someone uh, who's suffering from ALS. So these are advances in AI, obviously being built for in a very much more generic way, but truly are helping people uh, who need it the most. Uh, but then you take go from there along some of the trends uh, Albert was mentioning. For example, uh, we worked with our four hospitals to take their clinical data around eye care. Uh, one hospital in uh, India, uh, a, a couple in the United States, Australia, and even in Brazil. Get ground truth clinical data is the real scarce commodity here. But the magic happens, in this case, they brought all this eye care data uh, and then applied AI and machine learning. But the most interesting thing is they plumbed it all the way to the medical record and the point of care applications that are deployed in the various hospitals. So the next time the doctor is measuring something for a patient, they're able to use the intelligence that comes from all of these records and completely change health outcomes. Talking about robotics, just even this week, this, uh, I had a chance to meet a company uh, who's partnered with us called Brain Lab in Munich. Uh, who's doing some phenomenal work on neurosurgery. Uh, we obviously have done a lot of innovative things around VR and AR and HoloLens, uh, and they're applying. So a surgeon can use the holographic output from all of what has been simulated digitally to truly practice the surgery before the surgery. Uh, so the surgical outcomes of a neurosurgery can be completely different. Uh, so there are many, many examples of industry, I mean, uh, of hospitals uh, to drug uh, providers. In fact, if you think about uh, the industry uh, of drug discovery has always been, uh, I think, big users of computational power. But our ability to service them with more computational power and more AI techniques is improving. And even the mundane, the one thing I'll end with is we can get excited with a lot of technology, but the... People I meet in, uh, especially running hospitals, and uh, they tell me, look, the biggest cost still is administrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and workflow automation, so we worked with UPMC in uh, the United States, uh, just to start automating, uh, especially real-time automation, so that the doctor, the patient, and every provider are much more connected to the outcome. Uh, that itself, I think, can make a huge difference, at least in the United States, where we have a real challenge with our healthcare costs. Uh, I think that's probably one of the things that bends the curve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of these technologies you're talking about, they're out there today? May, every example I gave is all what's happening today. Uh, so we can now talk about what may happen in the future later on in the panel. Right. Uh, but the fact is we're in, living in a time where truly new technologies, but with the real domain understanding of what needs to be done, uh, magic can happen, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, Satya just mentioned data. And at Centene, you have a lot of data um, every day about what happens with your patients. Could you describe how you're, how you're beginning to use that? Sure. But I might just comment. Of course. What I think is really important is what you were talking about, Satya, about the 
the holograms and things, the technology that's improving the productivity and the outcomes for the physician. And so there's that, there's that side of it that I think is phenomenal. The thing that we're engaged with is looking at the data, and we have masses of it, but being able to analyze it and, and put it to practical use day in and day out. And we have one system interpreter that uh, can look at a million files we're talking about in the back room in five minutes. And it can, it can determine that somebody's potassium is going up, so they're at risk for a heart attack. It says the white blood cells are moving at a different level. And, and, and it's giving the doctor this information in real time. But what it's really doing more than anything else is it's allowing us to, to, be, to move in and be interdictive in a disease state so that you're able to go in before the person has the heart attack before, and, and discover what those issues are. If the genome is in there, it can tell us whether or not a um, new biotech drug will be effective on that person or not. So there's, there's a lot that's coming from the technology that's very practical day in and day out. We're also talking, we have a true care product that every day, the real, all the history on our patients in there, all the things that have been ordered are in the file. So that every doctor has an electronic record that's treating a highly acute case and can look at it and say, okay, they just changed this antibiotic, that bothers me on something, something else. And it avoids those kinds of errors. But the whole focus has to be on the patient. The other thing that I think you mentioned or uh, earlier someone mentioned is the personalization of medicine. And it's clearly moving in that way, and technology is enabling it. I mean, they're now mapping the genome of cancers. Mm -hmm. I always talk about St. Jude, where I've spent some time looking at it where a child's been told to take him home and uh, let him uh, make him comfortable, there's nothing more we can do. They take the child, they map the genome, they treat it very personally, and he goes home in full remission. Mm -hmm. So it's that type of technology, but it's understanding the patient and giving the doctor information in real time. The one other comment I will make is, it still doesn't replace the history and physical that a doctor mm -hmm. takes on the patient. The patient-doctor interaction and the, an, the importance of an Sorry, annual physical. Important. Interesting. Rajiv, at Nokia, uh, we know Nokia mostly for cell phones, uh, but you're making a big bet on healthcare. And, um, but you were describing uh, uh, backstage sounds really interesting in terms of both the present and the future, where this could go. Yeah, so well, Nokia today is a networks company, but we have a healthcare division. And as, as my colleague said, it's, it's a mission to be involved uh, in healthcare. So we believe in a world where you can move from reactive care to continuous monitoring, monitoring and, and really move to preventive care. Mm. Because chronic diseases are the leading cause of mortality today. Some 60% of all deaths in the world today, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, they're all chronic illnesses. Most of them are preventable, right? And many are even reversible with changes to diet and exercise and, and lifestyle. And some two-thirds of the cost of healthcare is on treating chronic illnesses. And, and, and we know globally that the cost has skyrocketed some 50 to 80% over the last 10 years. So at Nokia, we're trying to work on non-invasive non -invasive, um, wearable sensory devices so that you can continuously monitor the human body, so in vivo, uh, so to speak. So let me give a couple of examples. Imagine uh, the possibility of converting this massive scale medical device, optical coherence tomography. It's used for you know, retina scans and it's used for uh, cardiac uh, catheterization and, and so on. But imagine that you could uh, miniaturize that. So you convert it to a, to a miniature device with a thousand times reduction. So you, you make it a bit size chip. Yeah. And then you have it as a wearable device. So we're working on a sleeve, a thin unobtrusive sleeve uh, that you can wear and uh, that can continuously monitor many of these uh, stats. Um, or then take this technology and imagine a 3D OCT uh, scanning system that you can identify biochemical uh, specific information like cortisol levels, lactic acid levels, cholesterol as well, glucose, using Raman uh, spectroscopy. Uh, when you have all of that data, you are filling the void between consultations. Because you know you go to a doctor, you get a blood test, yeah. you get a scan done, it's a static scan, and then 
You come back three months later and you don't have any continuous monitoring of that data. Or then think about another non-invasive technique. So if the glucose goes out of whack, it's immediately picked up? It's immediately picked up, or you get your next doctor appointment. You've had that for the last three months. Mm -hmm. So you've had that information. It's immediately picked up as well. Right. Uh, or you know, electrical sensing, where you can non-invasively look at biopotentials, or body composition, neuromuscular analysis, all of that. So the point is, with these sorts of products that are continuously monitoring, there's a lot of data being thrown out that you can then analyze. Uh, but of course, you can start to prevent um, stuff before it occurs, and you know we we, we think that you can even uh, you can even figure out uh, through biomarkers you can even figure out cancers several months before they occur. Mm -hmm. And imagine you know every month and every day counts in the life of a cancer patient. So those are some of the examples of working on these leads. Because today we have wearable devices, but you know they're fitness devices, they're right. for enthusiasts, but they're not really medical grade. So I think in the future we'll see a lot of these devices move into, and I'm talking sort of a bit distant future here, but uh, really medical grade, FDA approved devices. At Nokia, we have a few of these. We have blood pressure cuffs, we have uh, a digital thermometer and, and, and so on, but we're not yet at that level. Right. But we are working with the Nokia Bell Labs on this you know, spectroscopy and OCT type devices. And you can bring it onto a chip. Wow, you can start to do a lot of things with mm -hmm. that real time. I want to talk about cost, but before we do that, I want to talk about the future and try to get you all to think five or 10 years out. Where does this go? Um, when, when you get up in the morning, uh, what are you most excited about that you think that, that uh, you know, AI, life sciences, genomics, you know, what, what sort of breakthroughs, Albert, do you see you know, in the pharmaceutical industry that you're hoping this will all lead to? Okay. I hope that uh, with the use of technology, we'll be able to find the cure of cancer. We will be able to unlock the mysteries of obesity. We will be able to reduce significantly cardiovascular deaths. Uh, the, the future is bright, uh, provided that uh, we do it with the patient centricity in mind. Mm -hmm. Sachi. You know, um, a couple of years ago, I uh, joined the board of uh, Fred Hutch, which is involved in uh, cancer research. And, um, as part of that, I you know, realized that one of the biggest um, limiters uh, for our advances towards finding the cure for cancer is keeping up with the knowledge that's being generated. Uh, interestingly enough, somebody was describing this to me, the amount of medic new medical knowledge uh, that is getting created, uh, I believe, is such that a medical student uh, is quickly out of date just the day they graduate, uh, huh. because in that period there is a complete new knowledge that they need to pick up. So one of the things that I think uh, we have to solve for in order to keep pace is uh, come up with techniques, that is AI techniques, that actually, for example, help a scientist, whether it's about drug discovery or a scientist who's doing some fundamental research around cancer, uh, to be able to form a hypothesis by actually, you know, getting on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's one area. Um, the other one, we recently did a partnership with uh, a, a company that is trying to do what we have done for the human genome for the immunology. So just imagine if we can, in fact, digitize uh, the, uh, all, the human Im immune system. Uh, and we then take that knowledge and apply it for something like precision medicine. Uh, that can be a real game changer. Uh, so the underlying thing, I think, is going to be data and our ability to reason over data on a continuous basis, some of the things that Rajiv was describing. Uh, over time, what we have to watch for is that we don't create more silos here. Uh, what could block all progress would be if we have lots of data, but there's no way to connect them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we can figure out a way to connect the data um, and, and then reason over it uh, in real time, Mm -hmm. uh, then I think there can be some miraculous uh, sort of advancements. Mm -hmm. I think if you think about five, ten years out, you're going to find some disease states that are troublesome today or less so. We're going to have curative, we're going to be interdictive, we're going to be preventing them before they even occur. I think we're also going to find, and there was a panel here I participated in several years ago, that you're going to, the population is going to age, mm -hmm. and they're predicting now where people will live to 120 in sound health up to that point in time because of these advances. Yeah. 
When is so, that going to happen? <laughs> in our lifetime. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, there's, there's hope. But um, I think as you start thinking about that, it says that the, the pace of technology, it's warp speed. And I think panels like this help because it helps to bring together the various thought and factors that are out there. And it's almost impossible to imagine how far out it can go, the data you're developing, the data that and what, what you've talked about, and our ability to analyze it and put it to practical use immediately. Mm -hmm. now, the one last thing I'll comment is the whole genome yeah. which they've raised. I mean, they're going to be able to be to analyze, and, and I made the comment the other day that I think hospitals are not going to exist 10 years from now as they do today because it's going to be outpatient treating with genome, mixing up the concoction. You'll have hospitals for trauma, OB, and, and joint replacements because that's still going to be mechanical. And so you're going to find the whole, and you're going to find costs coming down. Because technology always costs. I think about the original computers, how expensive they are. And now look what they are. And I think that same type of application we're going to see in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Rajiv, you were saying that uh, 5G is probably coming in a couple of years. So. Yeah. So 5G should start to happen later this year, but sort of more mainstream 2019, 2020. Uh, and, and I think really this, this level of connectivity will make a huge difference because if you think about all these continuous monitoring devices, uh, think about applications for elderly care at home, critical care, you, you mentioned it, so I, I think there'll be a world of medical homes, i.e. homes uh, connected to the hospital over the cloud and so when, because one of the problems is that if a patient's in the ICU, the monitoring is 90%, the patient uh, moves to uh, the general ward or, or the hospital room, and then it drops to 20 30%, goes home, and mm -hmm. the monitoring is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So you just have to rely on, right. if something goes wrong, you'll come to the hospital or you'll call an ambulance. And so how about continuous monitoring, and how about you know, connecting the hospitals to homes? Now, why is 5G important? Because when you have all of these devices, you're going to throw out millions and billions of bytes of data. And so the capacity that you're going to need from these continuous monitoring devices is something that current state networks cannot withstand or, or, or provide. Mm -hmm. So you need 5G for just sheer massive capacity because right. we're talking a thousand times more capacity in, in 5G compared to what we have in current A thousand state. times. Yeah, so, that's kind of, so then second is, um, is um, in the future, you'll be able to slice a telecom network. And so today, you have a 4G network. You just have one network. It serves consumers. It might serve enterprises. But in the future, you'll think about a network slice as a high-speed train where you have your own dedicated high-speed line, and there's no interferences or the train that's going to come in the way. Today's networks are a car going on a highway, and there's traffic, and you're, you know, there's congestion. Uh, and so you'll have your dedicated. So imagine a network slice for a group of hospitals or clinics and, and you have your own dedicated slice with very high user uh, uh, capacity and user levels. So uh, capacity, uh, network slicing, and then latency. And latency means responsiveness of a network. I press the button on my phone, how long does it take to you know, get an action? And of course, we don't care, uh, 40, 50 milliseconds is okay for us. But for these kinds of things, you need one millisecond of latency. And then you can imagine a doctor in Chicago doing a surgery, uh, for someone in Taiwan who's in an emergency situation uh, using robotic uh, surgery, so virtual reality-based robotic surgery. And why do you need that latency? Because you want the doctor to use haptic feedback to use that robot to actually do the surgery, and so you need this very tiny uh, latency. That is also needed for controls like you know, factory automation or driverless vehicles and so on. But in the, in the world of telemedicine, and really VR, remote robotic surgery, and, and you'll see it happen because why should all of these surgeries just have to be in the hospital mm -hmm. in a fixed network because today the capacity isn't available. So capacity, latency, network slices will, will make a massive amount of difference to many industries, but particularly healthcare. When is that surgery, that kind of surgery going to happen? A few years from now, I think it's possible 5G networks go on stream. Of course, we need to figure out um, not just the networks, but the hospital's propensity to to want these networks, to, to have that high level of uh, security and privacy that's needed. So we'll have legislation requirements for you know, security and privacy. I think one of the things to ensure uh, these sort of daily validation of data and devices, you could use a blockchain-based approach 
to, to introduce security and privacy. So that there's security, privacy, there's, there's the hospitals need to get it, that uh, we need this, they need to pull for it, of course. My customers, net network service providers, need to be able to provide that service as a new opportunity. So uh, I, I think, you know, two, three years from now. The other interesting thing is, think about a 5G ambulance. And we're working with China Mobile Research Institute on this notion of 5G ambulance. So uh, there's, a, there's someone who's had a heart attack on the street. You've got this continuous monitoring. Uh, the person, imagine this uh, ambulance with high definition scanners um, and, and cameras, got a CT scan and everything on board. But what you want is, the person's in the ambulance, you're gonna start taking a CT scan and you want these records uh, connected directly to the emergency room in the hospital. So all of that data is already transmitted to the hospital before this person is taken to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So by the time the hospital's there, the room's ready, you're in the ICU, and actually you've already got a bit of a diagnosis going. Mm -hmm. So this is plenty of opportunity once you've got this massive capacity and so on. I mean, it's interesting to see that connectivity could actually be the cure to some of these mm -hmm. uh, massive uh, illnesses. So all of these technologies sound great, but um, we're in a situation, at least in the U.S., where um, health care is, is a tremendous problem and a lot of people don't have access to basic health care. How, um, how is the advent of AI and these new technologies not going to widen inequality? I mean, I, I mean, I think, I mean, it's a, it is the real pressing issue. Like, take <laughs> even um, uh, the Veterans Administration and their uh, health care. One of the fundamental challenges we have is most of our veterans in the United States uh, go back to the rural areas. Um, and uh, in order to get even uh, to a VA clinic, uh, they need to drive. Uh, and, uh, but yet, there is telemedicine, but there is no connectivity uh, because of market failure in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the initiatives that we have recently started is this rural broadband uh, with partners to say what sort of uh, techniques and technologies could we use to essentially solve this essential, a problem which is a market failure of getting mm -hmm. uh, high-speed connectivity to rural areas because that's where we will need to be able to take some of what as Rajiv was describing, and we'll have to sort of say, how do we deliver the telemedicine? So I think uh, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the government, uh, whether it's the nonprofits, we will have to sort of really look at these advances, how do we democratize them? And I do fundamentally believe, uh, you know, Michael mentioned this, because the costs are gonna come down. So our, ch our ability to democratize access to world-class healthcare is going to be there. Uh, but it's just not, uh, the raw physics of it. I think there needs to be political will, uh, there needs to be private sector involvement, and then there needs to be a lot of other uh, initiatives that help us recognize the inequities uh, that go beyond health access uh, and deal with it as the pressing time in not just the United States, but all over the world. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I think, if I may add, I think what you see, you touched on something very important. It's, and we've talked about it in the past. We have, to, we have to move to policy from politics. Right. And if we can develop a policy-oriented approach that it's a fundamental right for individuals to have access to health care. Once you achieve that and you, and you start there, then it's incumbent on the individuals on this stage to help develop the techniques and the capability to do it in a cost-effective manner. And I think there's no doubt that can, that can happen. Mm -hmm. It can happen quickly. And also agree with Sadi. I think technology not only is going to increase the inequality, I think it is the most powerful lever we have right now to decrease it for all the reasons that he mentioned, uh, including the fact that technology can reduce significantly the cost of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, obviously drug prices are a big topic. You would see that happening around the world with drug prices as well. I mean, new medicines are very expensive, but over time you think that the cost will come down? Yeah, look, sickness costs a lot right now to society, not only in terms of human pain, but also in terms of economic burden. Mm -hmm. And for example, as demographics are going to make the problem larger because uh, people are living longer. And with an aging population, the prevalence of non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular is increasing. Mm -hmm. WHO, for example, estimates that Right now, 68% of the deaths in the world are due to these communicable diseases. And uh, the same organization estimated that the cost, 
So you see now the life. This is 38 million lives, right? Mm -hmm. You see now the human pain. But also in terms of cost, mm -hmm. cumulative WHO estimates that 47 trillion within 20 years will cost those deaths. Mm -hmm. This is 75% uh, of the global GDP of a year. And a lot of these diseases can be prevented because they can be diagnosed much earlier with technology, and so prevented, and also can be managed much better with technology so they can reduce the burden. There is a, let me start with one example of what you just uh, said, Rajiv. You spoke about uh, biological sensors. There was a study that tried to understand what will be the economic uh, impact of uh, good quality uh, biological sensors that they can help diabetic patients yeah. monitor their glucose and uh, manage better their treatment. And they concluded that if uh, the diabetic patient of uh, a population of US had these wearables, we could avoid 700,000 emergency room visits mm -hmm. and 340,000 hospitalizations. Yeah. And that would cost to the system if the cost avoidance to the system would right. be $47 billion in the US only in a year. So you can see that uh, the impact that technology can have on cost could be profound. And a, a couple examples of the St. Vincent Health um, Hospital in uh, Indiana uh, actually did this telemedicine with um, focusing on congestive heart failure patients and congestive respiratory uh, failure patients. And, and uh, they found through this uh, remote monitoring and telemedicine, they were able to reduce the rehospitalization rates quite substantially to 5%. That's a 75% reduction. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence exactly to your point that that happens. We had a situation, a couple of hospitals we worked with in, in a few countries where we have the blood pressure cuff and the data from that is given to the care team on a regular basis. So people that take control of hypertension through this, mm -hmm. found that uh, the, the, the rate of that control increased to 86%, so less visits to the hospital and so on, compared to the national average in America of, uh, 80, uh, of 55%. Mm -hmm. So again, there is enough evidence to suggest that many of these techniques will actually reduce, because you, know, you are moving to preventive care instead of reactive care, and like I said, you know, two-thirds of the cost globally is in reactive care of chronic illnesses. Michael, you mentioned uh, the opioid crisis and how you're, you're using that. Uh, I would say we, and I kept the data in front of me, but using machine learning, yeah. we have been able in our population to reduce it by 50%. And that's using predictive data to who may be in, in, prone to move into the, uh, the problems that can, excessive use can cause. Of opioids. Of opioids. Of, yeah. of opioids. And so, you know, and it's, you know, people talk, we can say it's 7.8 to $10 million a year in our population. I say forget the money for now. Hmm. Think about the number of people, 50% of the people, that are now going to have more normal lives right. because we were interdictive Absolutely. using this data and this learning. So you can intervene before? Before. I mean, they're looking through, and they, we have the screening. There's a whole series of things. I don't want to worry about the detail, but we can identify those people that are prone to be abusers. And then you, you take the necessary steps, yep. get them the help to avoid it. Yep. I, I want to give you one other factoid when you talk about cost. If you take smoking-related, mm. obesity-related, diabetes-related diseases, they reach about $300 billion a year in the US. So you're talking about a trillion dollars of expense just by, in, by affecting those three states. Cut it by 25% the first couple of years, and just continue to hammer away at it, you're going to pay for a lot of other advances. And, and to give you magnitude, or to put it in context, what uh, Michael just said, $300 billion, that could be, for example, the diseases related with smoking. Yeah. Uh, it is the entire cost of the country for medications. <laughs> the entire cost of the country for medication is the same amount. Mm -hmm. So we are talking small improvements right. in those areas, are having profound economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, before I open it up to questions, I, I would like to ask you all, we haven't talked much about the rest of the world. How will this play out globally? Do you see uh, China with its growing AI uh, 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 prowess uh, playing a leading role here? Could the US um, with privacy concerns start lagging behind? Um, 
how does this play out in, in India and, and Europe and other parts of the world? And who has in the advantage? I mean, I, I think you hit on the one uh, challenge, um, uh, which is clearly, if you look at all of the examples I think that all of us talked about, uh, data is going to be very important. Ground truth data. Yeah. Uh, especially on the clinical side, I think is going to be a big unlock uh, for how uh, one finds, uh, how one goes from being reactive to preventive. Yeah. And if you say that's true, uh, then how do we get access to that data? Uh, there are certain systems that are challenged. Uh, the U.S. in particular, I think, we are challenged because we don't have that one medical record uh, that is there that is universal. Uh, Large-scale hospitals and hospital care systems do have that advantage, but uh, we don't have it universally. Uh, Canada, for example, does. Um, and, uh, and so I think uh, China uh, clearly, just the demographics-wise, uh, will have an advantage in terms of population health being then translated uh, into preventive care or precision medicine. Um, and AI will play a role, but my own feeling is AI promise itself can become more commoditized over time. Uh, but the ability to have a policy framework, a connected uh, record at the population level and at the individual level so that you can truly deliver precision medicine, those are going to be uh, what's going to determine who's going to lead, who's going to follow. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work for all countries involved. I agree with everything. I couldn't agree more with what you've just said, but I want to add one other factor. Let's look at different continents and different countries and say, what are the issues? There are many countries just providing pure water For sure. will greatly overcome their health issues, that type of thing. So I don't think it's one, one answer for everything. It's looking specifically at a country. And in Africa and elsewhere, there's AIDS and things. Deal with water, AIDS, and a couple of things. You can meaningfully improve the health state of a large population. Then, then do the things you're talking about, and that's for the more advanced uh, economies. Rajiv, how about? I think, Satya, Michael, you said it well. Uh, the thing I'll add is that, of course, uh, it's underpinned by the connectivity that you can offer in the future, because if you're going to move to all of this continuous monitoring, you know, you need connectivity. You need connectivity. You need that high capacity simply to make something with that data, and uh, and so the one that race quickly to 5G networks and build it, keeping in mind the industrial use cases, particularly healthcare, will will, will be the winners eventually. Of course, there'll be telemedicine. It's not to say that developing countries will not get there because there's a lot of telemedicine and, and so on, which doesn't need this high capacity necessarily in all instances. But if you're going to move to a world of preventive healthcare. Uh, you know, 5G networks will be absolutely key, and, and that's going to start to happen uh, next year in, 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 in the U.S., in, in China, um, in parts of Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think when you look at that being mainstream, I'd say it's 2021, 22. So we're still a few years away from 5G networks be becoming more ubiquitous and, and mainstream, right. so it can be right. everywhere. Right. We, uh, just one last uh, question before we open it up. Uh, we haven't talked that much about genomics and CRISPR and, and how advances, um, how AI will help really advance gene research and the implications of that. Do you, do you all expect that to be a mega issue moving forward? It's uh, unbelievable the impact that artificial intelligence mm -hmm. will have on that. Just to give you two numbers to understand. The human genome has 30,000 genes and 3 billion pairs of DNA and uh, in DNA. So it is impossible uh, without the computing power of artificial intelligence to have meaningful progress, particularly when you want to correlate these billions of uh, information into every day, every moment phenotyping information that is connected by wearable devices. So it is uh, impossible to do it and uh, this is the major breakthrough. What is an example of what will happen when we're able to do it? We will be able to correlate and find, for example, that this gene is responsible for this type of behavior in the heart. And we'll be able to, to find this information, which is connecting one pair with one characteristic in your heart, among billions of information. I mean, ultimately, yeah. precision medicine really gets really personalized or really precise. Yeah. 
but I mean, one of the fascinating things to me is uh, how AI techniques developed for a lot of other purposes are turning out to be uh, very, very useful uh, in this quest for uh, precision medicine. But as we get good with the genome, we now have more digitized data. So the immune system and <laughs> then yeah. all of the, uh, the real-time feedback. Uh, so I think the one other place where we will be challenged uh, is to keep up with the compute capacity uh, along with the connectivity that Rajiv Excellent. made a fantastic case for. Uh, the other one is the compute power that is needed uh, in order for us to be able to actually apply AI and all of this digitized data to deliver precision medicine uh, is probably what's going to be the most exciting thing uh, in the years to come. I mean, in the next 10 years, that's going to be the solution. It's going to be outpatient. It's going to be drawing your blood. Uh, there's plenty of cells available now. And it's going to be very curative, yeah. very specific. We can't have these data voids between consultations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we'd like to open it up to questions. <coughs> um, I see one right here in the front. If you could please uh, identify yourself, that would be great. Um, sure, good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Jia. I'm a global shaper from Tianjin Hub from China, and uh, I run a healthcare startup in, in variables called iHealth. Um, so what I found basically as as the panel mentioned, actually, from China, getting co good quality medical data because of less regulation does be, is quite helpful. But I, I found one of the challenging things is actually developing the technology is okay, but is actually challenging to actually be able to get the payer to actually pay for it, the to have the business model, and uh, uh, that either insurance company or governments are are willing or, or start paying for it is 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 something what I I may found. Challenge. I'm, I'm not sure about the view from, from the panel whether whether having the developing of AI or precision medicine, etc., variables, whether do, do you see that can be a difficulty of, of getting paid from, from the payer? That's an excellent question. How are we going to pay for it? <laughs> Someone has to pay for it. And uh, <laughs> I mean, th the reality is, I think each country will decide uh, in terms of what the system is. Uh, but I guess the real challenge is access, uh, because there, you know, quite frankly, the the real question today is not about uh, who is going to pay for it, but how much uh, is what the outcome is going to cost. So one of the things that I do believe is there going to be a secular shift is instead of paying for just activity, people will pay for outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and so any if somebody is designing a system today, it's fresh. Uh, I think every payer will want to pay for outcomes. Um, and so as long as we at least recognize that that's the shift, whether it's in China or in the United States, uh, I think we will have a much more uh, stable uh, healthcare system uh, where every constituent there uh, truly does get, uh, I guess, the benefits uh, that are sustainable. Otherwise, I think we'll have an unsustainable system. I would agree with uh, Satya. And I'll, I would add that uh, because of... Uh, uh, increased healthcare costs, sometimes the reactions are irrational mm. uh, because we are having an acute issue that we are dealing right now. But uh, the truth is that uh, sickness is what is costing. And yeah. technology, as well as medications, are helping to reduce right. the cost. So once we will be able to come to an agreement that uh, when there is a clear evidence of uh, uh, benefit to the patients and the healthcare system, there needs to be a value that is calculated and then this value, we can uh, happily pay it for it, uh, things will become much easier. And the fact that uh, Satya spoke about we are moving in the healthcare system for a marketplace that it is much more volume-based, which means fee-for-service, for example, into a marketplace that it is much more value-based, which is outcomes-based reimbursement, for example, technology and data will allow us to be able to document the value that uh, we are producing with our interventions. So that will enable very different contracting relations between the parties. Mm -hmm. Including potentially, if it's outcome-based, personalized insurance. Including, this is a much bigger issue. It's, a, it's a, personalized that's insurance that's controversial, but yeah. That uh, comes <laughs> to human rights. But uh, I, I would say that uh, eventually, the health and the patients will be the big winners. I mean, we're moving more and more right now to value-based contracting. 
But I think even also, within the ACA oh, and all of the. Oh, we're, we're the largest ACA provider. We do it very well and doing very well with that product. But it's value based. But I think also we have to recognize the paradigm has to be one of sometimes you have to invest yeah. to save a lot. But this is the government. I know that. Right? We have to start to demonstrate how this investment will save a lot very quickly. Yeah. So, so you would expect the government is going well, to his? Well, I, I think it's going to be a combination of government and a lot of private sector as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I see one right there. Hi there. Uh, Human Hack Me. I run the diabetes group for Medtronic. Um, I have a question about patient engagement, and you had touched on this before. Um, all of these advances are amazing, but even if you make the greatest drug or the greatest wearable, there's no guarantee that the patient is going to take the drug or <coughs> wear the device. So how are you thinking about technology to engage the patient? Again, maybe I will use an example. I think uh, it's fascinating what's happening in this field right now. I mean, FDA approved the first uh, electronic pill, if I can call it like that. So it is a basically biological chip that it is in the tablet. And once you take the tablet and dissolves into your stomach, it sends a signal that you took the tablet. So imagine the applications of that, uh, compliance. Uh, the insurance companies to know that the medicines that patients should take, they do take them. Uh, it is uh, fascinating what happens in, in uh, this field. But of course, there will yeah. be an initial cost that someone needs to invest. Of course, educate, education, skills, but uh, my sense is that we will move increasingly. Today we have hospital-centric or doctor-centric care, and the question is, will we move to a patient-centric <laughs> care where the patient starts to pull uh, if you're going to move uh, particularly to a preventive healthcare world? Uh, and, and I guess we don't see that level of patient engagement today because the awareness is, is massive because many of these devices, they're not continuous monitoring and they're not medical grade today, it's the, the wearable devices I'm talking about. So the in vivo devices are, are more fitness-based devices as opposed to real medical grade making a difference. So if you have to stop pricking yourself and start to have a non-invasive technique to understand your glucose level or not to go to a blood test and, and understand your cholesterol levels, you know, then obviously people will go more for that option because it's just, it's just non-invasive to begin with, and it is continuous. So there's education, there's skills, but also you need the right kind of devices and infrastructure to be in place. Michael, uh -oh. with your uh, physical comment earlier, you seem to emphasize that we're still going to need the human, um, to his point about you know people just using it, you'll need the human interaction with the technology, not just the technology, Very right? Very true. And we've done a little research, not enough that I would consider it um, peer-reviewed hmm. level. Hmm. But it says a lot of individuals who do not take their drugs, it's, it's often because of a side effect. And that's where the physician, the nurse practitioners, others have to interface with the patient and help them understand the value and the benefit of it versus the other issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we've seen that, and we have to have a way to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, once again, that personal intervention. Sometimes it's needed that AI just won't do. Yeah, we, we believe also in a human augmented um, yeah. AI type of system, because yes, you have AI, but you, you will need that human in intervention. It's a combination of computers Absolutely. and people work best, not just. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I saw another question right here. Hi, um, my name is Yogesh Malik. I'm uh, the technology officer of Vion. Uh, we are the seventh largest mobile operator in the world. And I agree, technology will advance a lot. But the topic we are also reaching, the big challenge where data is going to be needed for everything. At the same time, we are talking about consent, privacy, GDPR. And the third angle is a cultural revolution where you cannot just augment by your own hunch, but you got to believe in the data and the AI. So how do you see these combining together to yield that super impact and empowerment to the grassroots? I think that's the question I see as a big challenge, but I'd be happy to listen to your views on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. At least I have an answer uh, as to how it'll sh uh, be shaped. But this is where I think um, the multiple constituents who are involved 
uh, in setting, let's say, the privacy guidelines, uh, people who are thinking about how do we bring down the healthcare cost, um, all have to come together. I mean, so that's why I think in, in let's, you know, at least let's take the case of liberal democracies. Uh, it has to start uh, with real legislative solutions to some of our society's hard challenges. Uh, unless and until we can confront that, uh, how does one actually say, oh, let me value privacy over better preventive care or precision medicine? Of course, both are valuable. Uh, but what are the, what's the framework that allows us to make sure that privacy, which is one of our enduring values, is not traded off, uh, but at the same time, we're not left behind with higher costs of medicine? Uh, so I don't think I have uh, a way to predict how this will shape up, but uh, I do believe that uh, in institutions uh, like uh, le the legislatures have to really function uh, in order to really do these, uh, you know, come up with new equilibria that allows us to make progress as a society. Mm -hmm. Of course, the thing with privacy and security, it's not just going to touch uh, health, it's going to touch many other industries. Um, and. The thing is, countries are going with their legislations and, 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 and policy requirements, but it is difficult to globally harmonize laws around privacy and security, right? That's not going to happen. It's almost impossible to achieve. So the question, we were debating this yesterday also in the United Nations Broadband Commission, uh, and we were talking about whether there should be some, at least some global standards and assessment principles that can be followed on privacy across the world. I don't know which entity has uh, sort of globally has that legitimacy to take the lead uh, in that because ultimately countries are countries and but my sense is at least as a minimum acceptable requirement we need some global uh, norms uh, principles standards so that we can drive this sort of privacy uh, across the world it's a hard nut to crack it's yeah and at some level by the way just on privacy but uh, gdpr hopefully de facto becomes that, uh, because the last thing the world needs now is more fragmentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can like, take all of the work that we've had to do to become GDPR compliant and build on it, uh, versus to your point, Rajiv, uh, fragment, uh, then I think at least we're on the path uh, that will still help us resolve how do you keep privacy while at the same time being able to use data uh, in different contexts that create common good. Yeah. Well, it's a technology issue because technology is exposing what used to be very private yeah. in ways that we don't recognize until it actually occurs. Yeah. We have time for one more. Oh. Maybe you could uh, both ask your question and then we'll tackle it before we wrap up. Uh, Arun Sharma, I'm a board member in the Adani Group and also a Deputy Vice Chancellor at Queensland University of Technology. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I want to bring the, the topic back to the patients. The, the, the entire discussion is about compliance. Why aren't they doing it? Why don't we just treat the patient as what they are? They have their mix of what level of technology they are able, able to, to accept, where they want human intervention, and where their behavioral profile of doing things uh, is, is important. And I think doing an analysis of the patient's behavioral pattern is going to be extremely important in the effectiveness of these things. Like, you know, even the most human touch person is perfectly happy when you tell them that a robot will be able to take you to the toilet. They rather prefer that for their privacy than a human taking them. Right. So we don't know these answers. And once we start doing it, the effectiveness is there with the patient, and they become our advocates. Policy doesn't change because a bunch of academics come up with an idea or a bunch of corporate sectors say this is the greatest technology solution. Policy change happens because politicians listen to the voters. Okay? <laughs> and we have to make patient the center of attention here. Yeah. Understand what they are prepared to take and how we adopt our technology, and of course, over time, using machine learning and behavioral economics, nudge them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And they become our advocates, and they are the ones who are going to help the legislative change that is going to make this change. And then the one last question. Thank you, Yossi Ben Amram from American Company. My question is, uh, in view of the technological advancement that you just described, what do you see the role of the big pharma company in this equation going forward? Let the panelists quickly react to either of those. 
Albert, I, see, I think you're stuck. I see, <laughs> yeah, I see the role as very important. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are all about uh, creating uh, patient value. And uh, actually, the more uh, value we create, this is the more value we can create also for our shareholders. So the, the two are very connected right now. So I see that technology is providing me an opportunity to do my job much better, more efficient, to come to discoveries and achievements that I wouldn't dream to do before. And also at the same time, I see that technology will enable overall the healthcare system to become much better, more efficient, more effective, and eventually create health for the world. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I think that uh, the impact that we can have by embracing the technology, by mastering technologies that we are not familiar now with, and by partnering with people that they are experts on that, it's an obligation that we have. It's, not, uh, it's an obligation to, to society because uh, they expect from us to find the solution. And uh, uh, before we wrap up, I would love to ask each of you if there was one thing you could change or one uh, challenge, uh, problem that you think really needs to be worked on uh, before we can <laughs> kind of get to this um, vision of a technology-enabled you know, future with, mm -hmm. with significantly better outcomes <laughs> in terms of healthcare. I just love to yeah. love to go around. From my perspective, and we talked about it, uh, if uh, <laughs> I could change one thing, that would be regulations. I think technology is moving in a much faster pace than legislators. Regulations must catch up. We are talking about data interoperability. We are speaking about enhancing security and privacy rules, but at the same time, uh, do not block progress with excessive and unrealistic restrictions. And we need the regulatory uh, system to modernize itself so that they can review and approve those technologies because health is an extremely regulated environment. So if I could change one thing, I would bring regulations to the 21st century. Are they worse in the US or Europe or where are they most challenging for you? I think all over the world. I think, the, and don't take me wrong, uh, regulators are trying to catch up, but right now they are behind, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I don't know. I'll pick up on the gentleman's comment. Actually, I think uh, perhaps maybe keeping patients and patient um, care at the as the central driver of what needs to happen, uh, that hopefully brings all the constituents together. Uh, maybe that's what we need. Uh, technology and technology advances are undeniable. Our ability to manage even the hard challenges that we face today in terms of cost of care uh, is tangible. Uh, but then what's the, our ability to actually deliver the benefits of all of this, I think, is going to be more about our policies and uh, coming together in a way that all constituents have consensus to deliver ultimately to the patient or the citizen. Uh, maybe that's what we should optimize around. What I came to realize in the last 45 minutes or hour is that there are four individuals on this stage that don't really compete day in and day out, but have various roles to play within this. And somehow we have to find a mechanism to encourage more of this kind of discussion where the groups of individuals figure out how to work together against the common objective of ensuring that technology is applied in a constructive way that's patient-centric and, and helps reduce costs. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a multi-stakeholder world, as you said, Michael. And, and for me, I think the biggest thing I want to change is that we realize that reactive care is always ever going to be more expensive and more painful uh, than <laughs> preventive care. So I'd like all players in the ecosystem to drive towards preventive care, and I think the comment made by yourself is spot on, that it needs to be patient-centric and different people in different parts of the demographic are going to have different behaviors and acceptance rates, for example, elderly care versus other sections of the society, and we need to adapt to that. So this patient-centric care and the notion of preventive care and the fact that that through technology is going to be the biggest cost uh, reduction enabler. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like you all to join me in thanking our panelists for a fascinating and very productive discussion. Thank you.